This is the MyHeart.net podcast. This show is produced by Dr. Philip Johnson in conjunction with VitalEngine.com. Please welcome your host, Dr. Elaine Bouchard of Cardiology Specialist of Birmingham, Alabama at St. Vincent's Medical Center, part of Ascension. Welcome to our podcast on amyloidosis. Uh, my uh, co-chair of the session, Dr. Mustafa Ahmed, um, Director of Interventional and Structural Program at UAB. We have a special guest today is Dr. Jason Guichard, who is the Advanced Heart Failure Specialist, the Director of the Heart Failure Program, um, as well as the Transplant Program at Prisma Health in South Carolina. Gentlemen, you know, welcome to our podcast. Now, some people may ask themselves, you know, why amyloidosis? And we felt like it would be important because amyloidosis is life-threatening and it's underdiagnosed. And it's a disease that is associated with heart failure. As we know, approximately one to 2% of the adult population in the United States has heart failure. And the prevalence in patients that are greater than 70 years is actually greater than 10%. It is predicted that by 2030, in the next 10 years, we'll have approximately over 8 million people that suffer from congestive heart failure. Of these, about 50% have heart failure with normal pump function. The, uh, there are several causes for heart failure with normal pump function, but very little treatment. Amyloidosis is one of those causes, and we have now some treatment for amyloidosis. For this reason, uh, we, we decided to do this podcast and uh, we have a specialist uh, in amyloidosis center in South Carolina, Dr. Jason Gishar. Jason, tell us what happens to your body when you have amyloidosis? Yes, there's a, um, kind of four common causes of um, amyloidosis and particularly cardiac amyloidosis, which is um, what we're talking about today. Um, and really, it's identifying uh, which of those four you may have, and that guides um, treatment. Um, so really, the four types is AL amyloid. This is due to abnormal light chain production from the bone marrow. The second group is what we call TTR amyloid or transthyretin amyloid. This is an abnormal protein that's made in the liver, which then uh, misfolds and aggregates and then deposits in the heart. And the TTR can actually come in two forms. One is called wild type, um, which is normal. And the other type is what we call um, hereditary, um, which is a mutant protein um, that predisposes someone um, for this particular um, process. And then the fourth is AA amyloid, um, which is uh, due to serum amyloid protein A, um, which is generally due to inflammatory processes. Um, one of the more kind of common ones would be um, rheumatic fever. This is rarely seen and developed in industrialized nations. We generally don't see this a whole lot. So the two major types of amyloid that's found here in the United States and um, most industrialized nations is AL amyloid and TTR amyloid. So the first um, part is actually distinguishing which two you might you may have. Um, and that's the first thing that any uh, physician will um, do and, and talk to you about. Um, so there's actually a host of different tests um, and, and imaging that can be done to kind of distinguish those two types. So before we get into this, uh, Jason, um, I mean, normally the liver produces this protein, this uh, transthyretin, and um, I guess in certain people that suffer from um, congenital um, or familial amyloidosis, that protein is abnormal when it's uh, made into the liver. But in the in patients that have secondary amyloidosis or in patients that are in the elderly, the protein is actually uh, made by the liver, comes out normal in the bloodstream, but then something happens, it becomes unstable, and, and then what happens? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So the, the normal protein um, becomes unstable, disassociates, and then those, um, it's normally what we call a tetramer, so four little subunits um, bind together into the normal protein. But in certain cases, we don't exactly sure know why in some people's bodies that tetramer dissolves and these proteins become monomers, so just single units, and then they um, aggregate to form, to form um, am, amyloid fibrils, and those fibrils are then deposited into the heart. So that, um, that's how the, the wild type or normal um, transthyretin um, pathogenic process happens. 
They so they get um, deposited into the heart as well as other organs. Um, that, yep, that's correct. So um, amyloid is a multi-organ um, um, process. Um, the main thing um, for TTR is the cardiac part or cardiomyopathy, but there's also a huge um, affinity for nerves as well. So uh, polyneuropathy or uh, other neuropathies are a um, huge part of TTR amyloid as well as in some cases AL amyloid. Um, an AL amyloid um, protein can deposit in the kidneys and the liver, um, in the tongue, as well as the heart. So amyloid, you know, we're talking specifically about cardiac amyloid. You know, we're cardiologists. This is a cardiology um, podcast, but the reality is that these proteins can actually deposit in, in multiple different organs. Um, and depending on which type, there's a um, predisposition for the proteins to deposit in various different organs. Um, but yes, this this process is a uh, multi-organ issue, which is why multidisciplinary clinics and multidisciplinary groups are incredibly important, um, both the, on the hematology side, the neurology side, the orthopedic surgery side. There's a lot of overlap of this disease process amongst various different specialties. So, Jason, two questions. So, when I, when you know, when I was training initially, uh, and Dr. Bouchard, you'll probably echo this. So, you know, amyloid wasn't this big thing. And now it's one of the hottest topics there is in terms of advancements in cardiology. So what kind of happened there over the last 10 or, you know, 15 uh, years or so? And the next thing is when people have heart failure, right? Normally that shortness of breath, maybe swelling, that kind of thing. Well, when, when someone goes to see a doctor, is that the, is there anything special about how those people present when it comes to that, you know, specific heart failure where you would think, oh my gosh, you've got, you know, amyloid versus other types of heart failure? Yeah, those are both excellent questions. Um, so we'll um, answer the first one uh, first. So the, the main reason why cardiac amyloid and specifically TTR amyloid has become kind of rose in prominence is that now we have medicines to treat it. So before, up until just a year ago, um, there were no treatments for this disease process. So there was a lot of pragmatic people that believed, you know, if we can't treat it, then why are we looking for it? So I, I don't necessarily agree with that thinking, but that was largely the thinking amongst physicians that if you can't treat something, if you can't help something, then why care about it or why try to identify it? Um, but that's no longer the case. So there's been a huge revolution um, in the, in the cardiac amyloid space as far as medications that we can use um, to actually treat these patients. Um, as a matter of fact, there's even newer medications in the pipeline. So this has now become a disease process that we can treat. Um, and therefore, the awareness um, and the excitement around this disease process has, has increased. So the short answer to your question is, why is it rising in prominence now is that we can actually treat it, which is exciting, especially for people who have been waiting for these treatments for a long time, seeing these patients kind of dwindle and suffer, um, we now have actually medications to, to help improve their quality of life and their mortality. Um, the uh, um, second question, um, sorry, what was the, the, second, the second question? <laughs> so, that's awesome. So pay, when um, people normally present with heart failure, that's right, it's yeah. like, you know, shortness of breath, uh, yeah. swelling fatigue and we've been making that diagnosis um commonly is there something for you know either in terms of from a patient basis or a just an examination basis where you would think gosh we really need to rule out amyloid as a cause of yeah it? yeah so you know heart failure um you know is, is has very general um you know diagnostic symptoms you know shortness of breath dyspnea on exertion you know shortness of breath when you exert yourself or swelling. So, I mean, there's a, you know, those are very general symptoms. Um, and, uh, you know, largely cardiac amyloid, at least in, in, in our office, you know, it, we kind of exclude other common causes of heart failure first, you know, before we go down that route. Um, so treating people with uh, medical therapy for heart failure, whether that is diuretics or otherwise. Um, and if patients still have persistent symptoms, is one thing. So symptoms out of proportion to what you actually see um, on your evaluation or what you see on the echocardiogram um, or some red flags, some clinical red flags, which are well known um, in, the, in the cardiac amyloid world. If these patients kind of meet 
um, those red flags or kind of check the box of those red flags and increase their pretest probability for having cardiac amyloid. And those would all be indicators where you would consider testing those patients um, um, early um, than you would otherwise. Um, so I think it's really kind of being keen on the different symptoms, um, being keen on some of the surrounding um, demographics that kind of um, go hand in hand with this disease process. Um, and uh, when other things have been excluded and you still have a symptomatic patient, kind of thinking, start thinking outside the box rather than just giving up on a patient, thinking a little bit outside the box to some of these rarer disease processes. So, so Jason, if you have a, a patient that you see, they're very tired all the time, they have no energy, they're very short of breath, uh, they can't hardly do anything, as a matter of fact, they're in their 70s or 80s, and uh, you, you know, you invest, you do the, uh, the regular investigation, you do an EKG, it's looking pretty good, but no real sign of LVH. Uh, you do an echocardiogram, uh, an ultrasound of the heart, and you find some hypertrophy or thickening of the heart muscle, but the heart function looks superb. I mean, the ejection fraction is like 45 to 55% completely normal. So if you're short of breath and you have a normal pump you know, function, you could have you, you have to think about amyloid in these patients, right? Yes, that's absolutely, that's absolutely correct. So one of the kind of red flags that we use in our office are, you know, patients that have extreme symptoms, you know, very short of breath, very dysmic with exertion, you know, very miserable. They've been hospitalized once or twice. They're just very miserable. But you look at their echo, you look at their echocardiogram, and it just doesn't look that bad, right? They've got a normal ejection fraction, you know, maybe a little mild LVH, maybe a little TR, you know, nothing for a cardiologist that would, you know, really kind of um, make you worry about the echocardiogram. These are exactly the patients um, that would be reasonable to be tested. Um, some of the additional red flags, you know, we talked about already is the, the LVH um, on the echocardiogram, but let's say a normal or low voltage on EKG on the electrocardiogram. So this shows a discordance, right? You're seeing you know, a big LV on the echocardiogram, but low voltage. So this would be suggestive of some sort of infiltrative process, which is what the, the cardiac amyloid protein does, infiltrate the heart. Um, other things that would lead you in that direction are, um, you know, blocks, various different blocks, um, you know, heart blocks or the need for a pacemaker. Um, other things, you know, other organ failure, such as kidney disease or polyneuropathy or dysautonomia, which is something that makes these patients very miserable. Um, another one is the bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. That's a huge, um, um, red flag for, for, um, for TTR amyloid, um, as well as biceps tendon rupture. That's another one. Um, and, uh, and of course, troponin levels and elevated BNP. So these patients don't look so bad on echo, but you know, their troponin's elevated, which is a heart marker, um, for, for potentially heart stress or heart damage. Um, and an elevated BNP, a brain natriuretic peptide was also another marker for, um, ventricular or atrial stretch um, or volume overload. So looking at some of these red flags in the setting of a normal um, ejection fraction or echo can kind of give you confidence that maybe, you know, looking for cardiac amyloid would be worthwhile. Very much. Uh, thanks, Jason. I, you know, what you describe reminds me a lot of my patients that are in their 70s or even in their 80s. Uh, they have, uh, you know, their blood, blood pressure is very difficult to control because they go hypertensive. But when they stand up, the blood pressure really drops uh, significantly, very, very labile. Uh, but then what about the, uh, the, the some of the younger patients? For example, I've had some patients, African-American, that were younger with an incredible amount of hypertrophy on, on their echo. As a matter of fact, some of them had an obstructive dynamic. I mean, we, we had to, even some of them, uh, we send them to surgery to get a septectomy or removing part of the septum, uh, part of the wall of, of the heart so they wouldn't have this obstruction. I mean, does that kind of clue in more to the, the more familial type of uh, amyloidosis um, in those cases rather than the wild type? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, distinguishing between, you know, cardiac amyloid <clears throat> and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be a little tricky because on echo, they even look the same. The symptoms, um, as a matter of fact, can quite be, can be very similar. One of the telltale signs to um, decipher between cardiac amyloid and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy would be the EKG. As we all know, the 
electrocardiogram, you know, usually show the just massive, you know, R waves um, um, indicating the um, um, high voltage um, um, for the EKG on the cardi or for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. Whereas in the infiltrative or amyloid patients, these voltages are very low. So it's actually a very um, quick and easy way to kind of lean you in one direction or the other, whether or not these African American patients, um, you know, have a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or maybe this is just amyloid. Um, uh, other things that you need to think about in young patients, as you suggested, is the hereditary type of amyloid. This is um, the abnormal um, transthyretin protein that's made in the liver. These patients develop cardiac amyloid earlier in life. Um, so that is, you know, a demographic, again, African-American population. Um, this particular abnormal gene is present in about 3.4% of African-Americans. So this is something that um, needs to be thought about, needs to be considered in these patients and um, can easily be identified with genetic testing. Um, just a, a cheek swab. Um, um, don't even have to do a blood test in a lot of cases to actually identify um, some of these uh, abnormal genes, um, which can also identify people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well. Um, so all of these, um, you know, diagnostic tests can be, um, can be helpful in distinguishing, uh, you know, young African-American patients with, uh, with um, LVH on echo. So we have the uh, AL amyloidosis, which is one of the most common. I mean, the AL amyloidosis, the light chain, uh, is it like, um, like multiple myeloma type of uh, picture? Is it, is that, you know, when we, um, we, we work with the oncologist, the hematologist, maybe to help us differentiate these patients versus the others? Yes, correct. So, you know, all patients, um, if, you're con if you're worrying or considering cardiac amyloid, the recommendation is to test for both TTR amyloid and AL amyloid um, concurrently or at the same time. So generally what that would look like would be, um, you know, a, a technetium labeled phospho, uh, phosphate scan, um, which will look for the abnormal TTR protein in the heart. And at the same time, we check blood levels for free light chains, um, as well as um, serum and um, urine electroprotein phoresis. Um, this will distinguish those patients that may have AL amyloid. Um, so the free light chain, um, kappa and lambda free light chain, Studies will detect the plasma cell dyscrasia, the abnormal um, production, either the kappa or lambda light chains. Um, and then, of course, the protein um, serum and the urine electrophoresis will tell you if it's a monoclonal, spe monoclonal spike, sorry, um, which would indicate a you know, particular <clears throat> cell that's producing that abnormal protein um, in very high abnormal amounts. Um, if those are positive, um, the recommendations are if there is an M spike, um, or monoclonal peak is what it's called, to get those patients evaluated by a hematologist or oncologist, um, because the possibility of having AL amyloid would be high. Um, and uh, the pyrophosphate scan would actually identify patients who may have TTR amyloid. So those are kind of the initial screening tools that we use to um, begin to dissect away, you know, which amyloid um, a patient may or may not have. You know, I've been, um, I've been, ordering these tests i mean for light chains and kappa and lambda uh, light chain uh, and a lot of them become uh, are coming back abnormal uh, i'm not sure i mean is there is there a certain level um, where you kind of get concerned about uh, is there kind of a ratio we need to look at or or we should just if you have an abnormal finding you should refer them to the oncologist Yes. So what I've, um, you know, done because we've got a, you know, very good multidisciplinary group um, that's willing to see patients, any sort of blood abnormality with the free light chains, um, which is a blood test or um, with the protein electrophoresis, I will get them to the hematologist um, for evaluation. But generally speaking, um, to have multiple myeloma um, or AL amyloid, the free light chain ratio is very elevated, either, either high or low, depending on which free light chain you have. I think the normal ratio is between, um, I believe it's 0.5 and 1.5, so if you're either below that ratio or um, above that ratio, then that would be abnormal. And then in addition to that, having uh, a monoclonal peak um, would be suggestive of having some sort of um, um, you know, plasma cell dyscrasia, whether that's MGUS all the way to AL amyloid. Um, you know, would be something that would need further evaluation. So we are worked very hand in hand with our hematologists um, at our health center um, because sometimes there is um, some questions um, and there is some overlap there. 
So having a good relationship with your hematologist, your local hematologist is always uh, important for a local um, you know, cardiac amyloid program. So for the patient, I guess what we have to remember is that you're short of breath, you have normal pump function. First thing we do is we get a blood test. And if it's, um, you know, the, lamp, the kappa and lambda cha- uh, light change that we measured, if abnormal, you will refer, you're referred to a hematologist and try to sort it out. Now, you mentioned a technetium uh, pyrophosphate and that you could, uh, you, you could maybe detect changes in patients that have familial type. Now, would they show, uh, first of all, I'd like for you to kind of uh, go uh, explain a little bit more about that technician pyro- pyrophosphate for the patient's sake. What should they expect? Uh, is it just an injection and they take pictures of you? Te- can you explain a little bit more about that scan? Yes. So the technetium labeled, um, which is the radio tracer um, that we use, that's labeled to the pyrophosphate, which is the, the molecule that binds um, abnormal um, TTR cardiac amyloid protein. Um, is the really the scan of choice um, and has become um, you know kind of the gold standard for or not the gold standard but a, uh, the best non-invasive way of detecting um, um, TTR amyloid. So the sensitivity is about um, 99% specificity, is about 97%. So an excellent test. The gold standard um, is actually RV biopsy, so cardiac biopsy is, is truly the gold standard. But um, a non-invasive way of identifying cardiac TTR amyloid is, is always um, important. So the test itself is actually fairly straightforward. Um, what a patient would expect um, is about a three hour test. Um, so you show up usually in the morning um, and you are injected with the radio tracer. This is the technetium labeled um, pyrophosphate scan. Um, there is a, a wait of about an hour while the, while the radio tracer um, circulates through your blood um, and has time to bind to anything um, um, where the TTR may be, um, and uh, specifically in the heart, if that's what we're concerned about. At the one hour mark, a scan is done. Um, This can be done with a uh, either spec, which is like a typical stress test um, that's done in a scanner, um, or it can be done planar, which is basically just a kind of a plain film, just a one dimensional film, um, which is a a, a little bit quicker and easier for patients. Um, If the scan is positive, then you're done. Positive is read by the um, uh, radiographic texts that look at a ratio, a preliminary ratio. And if it's positive, then there's no need to go any further. If it's um, kind of equivocal or not necessarily positive, they'll wait a few more hours. So they could potentially wait three hours and repeat the scan um, to see if uh, there's any more uptake um, of this radio tracer in the heart. If that remains negative, then it's a negative test, uh, which is very reassuring um, for not having um, cardiac TTR amyloid. But if the test is positive, um, this is a very you know, good, sensitive and specific test. And in most cases um, um, would lead to the diagnosis of cardiac TTR amyloid and then would lead to potential therapies. Now, I will say that there is a small group of patients um, where the test is equivocal, you know, no test is perfect. So you can have these gray area tests um, where you know, it's not negative, but it's not truly positive. So what do you do after that? So there is a small group of patients that need to proceed on with um, cardiac biopsy or right ventricular um, biopsy. And um, uh, this could be used as the tiebreaker, so to speak, um, to see if a patient, you know, has cardiac TTR amyloid or not, or really any, you know, infiltrative or restrictive cardiomyopathy. Um, Sometimes the the cardiac biopsy can be very helpful. So being at centers that have that capability um, can be, uh, you know, important when you're looking for a diagnosis. So Jason, let's say... um someone's test comes back positive uh, and based on your history, physical tests and scans that you now say this person has a amyloid as a, what, what's, what's next to expect for a patient? What's the process? Yep. So all of our positive scans, um, we see them in the office and we, at that point kind of do two things. Um, number one, we talk to the patient about their symptoms and about their diagnosis. And if it's very clear cut, and what we will do at that point is that has identified them as having cardiac TTR amyloid, but it has not identified their type. So the next question that you have is, is, is this wild type you know, due to a normal protein or is this hereditary due to a mutant protein? So all of our patients, one of the first things that we do is genetic testing. So genetic testing um, in our office is actually very easy. It's just a little cheek swab that we do. Um, we actually are able to do this test for free. Um, we've been 
kind of gifted being able to do the genetic testing for free. It's normally, you know, a couple hundred to several hundred dollars. So we're able to offer this to all patients um, to test their gene to see if they're wild type um, or hereditary. So that's one of the first most important things that we do um, at that visit. The second thing is getting them started on therapy. So if we are convinced um, that a patient does indeed have cardiac TTR amyloid, then the second thing that we do would be to begin the process of getting them on medications. Um, the only approved medication um, at this time for cardiac TTR amyloid is a medicine called Tefamidus. The brand name is also Vindicale or Vindamax. Um, so we start all of our patients on therapy as well. So those would be the two things to expect um, kind of on a, a standard follow-up patient that has a positive pyrophosphate scan. Now, as we talked about before, you know, some patients can be equivocal or on the fence. So there's a smaller group of patients where we end up talking about that and we talk about um, doing a heart biopsy or a right ventricular biopsy as a way to really um, identify if the patient has um, cardiac amyloid or not. Um, you know, these medications and, and the genetic testing, you know, are additional parts and things that we don't want to do um, or start patients on if they don't absolutely need it, um, largely because of the, you know, the cost of the medications. So for all of our patients, we really want to make sure that they do indeed have cardiac TTR amyloid before, um, before starting therapy. Thank you, Jason. Um, I remember going back on the technician power phosphate, I remember in the 80s, we used to order this test to detect myocardial infarction. Um, when do you, so it's been around for a long time, and it's nice at least to have a, a tool like this that can really identify the problem in, in some of these patients. When do you uh, test uh, with a um, cardiac MRI, or do you ever? So cardiac MRI is good. Um... And uh, you have varying opinions on the, on the utility of cardiac MRI. So cardiac MRI will tell you if there's abnormal findings in the heart. Um, but of course, um, um, so very sensitive, but not necessarily specific. So there are, you know, a handful of different infiltrative cardiomyopathy processes um, that can have a similar pattern to amyloid. Um, so it, with cardiac MRI, you look at patterns. Um, and these patterns are either diagnostic or non-diagnostic but it doesn't tell you for sure what you have um, inside your heart. Um, you know, it just suggests that you have scarring or, you know, infiltrative processes type going on. So at our center, we use cardiac MRI um, sometimes as a tiebreaker. If someone has an equivocal PY, you know, pyrophosphate scan, and we're looking for something else to add to that. And someone doesn't want to have a biopsy, then sometimes we'll do cardiac MRI. Um, but to be honest, with the success and the, the high sensitivity and specificity of the pyrophosphate scan, um, and then the very few folks where it's um, you know, non-diagnostic or equivocal, and then moving on to biopsy, you know, really the utility, and this is our center, you would have people that would argue otherwise, probably people that are you know, heavily invested in cardiac MRI or imaging um, that would probably argue that everyone should have a cardiac MRI, but we just haven't found it you know, necessarily helpful um, you know, in the long run mainly because, you know, it still doesn't give you a, um, um, an actual diagnosis. It's still just a pattern on an imaging um, modality. Well, let's, go, let's talk about the treatment maybe a little bit more. We have, obviously, uh, we can have a candidate uh, that is a patient uh, that is young, has this, this very severe uh, thickness, increase in thickness of the heart muscle, this severe cardiomyopathy, at the other spectrum, we have our 70 or 80 year old that may have a wild type of amyloidosis. Some of these patients actually may have had a, a problem with their aortic valve. We know that, for example, about 20 to 25% of our patients in their 80s, they've had a TAVR uh, or, or they've had problem with their valve. And Dr. Ahmed you know, had, treats a lot of these patients. Um, do you treat all these patients the same way? And if you treat it with uh, this medication, how long do you treat them for? Yeah, those are all great questions. Um, so this comes down again to the um, distinguishing between the wild type TTR amyloid and the hereditary TTR amyloid. So 2018 was a, was a great year um, for cardiac amyloid or um, TTR amyloid in general. Um, there was actually three medications um, that were all had positive effects for patients with TTR amyloid. Um, the first one was Tefamidus. That was the ATTRACT trial, which was hugely successful, published uh, September 2018 in New England Journal of Medicine. 
and was approved for all types of cardiac TTR amyloids. So cardiac um, amyloids, it was the first and only. Now, the other two medications came out a little bit earlier that year, 2018 in July, New England Journal of Medicine. And they looked specifically at the hereditary type for the mutant type of TTR amyloid. And they did not look at the cardiac manifestations. They actually looked at the neurologic manifestations. So these two medications, um, one is called Patisseran, or um, Patro is the brand name. The other one is Inotirsin, um, or Tegsetti is the um, brand name. We're both approved recently, about a year ago, for um, polyneuropathy associated with hereditary TTR. So the first thing when we see patients and they have cardiac TTR amyloid, we start them on tofamidus because that is the only medication. This uh, medication, as I said in the ATTRACT trial, was shown to improve symptoms at six months. So we tell patients to expect an improvement in symptoms at about three to six month range, which we, we've actually found to be true. Um, and a mortality benefit at 18 months. At about a year and a half, the curves for mortality begin to separate pretty significantly. So we tell patients to expect to be on this medication lifelong. You know, this is a lifelong process of the abnormal protein being generated out of the liver and with the very low side effect profile of the medication, as a matter of fact, the same as placebo. So virtually no side effects. And, uh, you know, the chronicity of disease, this is a medication that people stay on lifelong. Now, to fam, this does have the dubious extinction uh, or distinction, excuse me, of being the most expensive cardiovascular drug on the market. It has a list price of about $225,000 a year. So it is a very, a very expensive medication. And this actually pales in comparison to Patisseran, which is $350,000 a year, and then Inotirsin, which is $450,000 a year. So this is a, a rare disease space. So that we are, you know, in our office and clinic is used to the rare disease space, specifically with pulmonary hypertension. So pulmonary hypertension, like TTR amyloid, is a rare disease. So their medications are hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So it takes kind of specialty office staff to be able to work through that process to get these medicines approved, um, to go through specialty pharmacy to get the medicines delivered. Um, and in some cases with Patisseran and Inotirsin going through infusion clinics to get the medicines uh, for the patients. As you might imagine, you know, being a healthcare provider, I take all these medications very seriously. I take our healthcare dollars very seriously. So being able to identify patients, you know, with very high certainty um, before going down the pathway of medications um, is important. But the short answer to your question is, you know, these medicines are lifelong because these um, disease processes are, cons you know, constantly ongoing. And because of the benefits of the medications, um, you know, it's hard to deny them um, to patients. And we work the best that we can to get them affordable for the patients, including being involved in clinical trials. So we have, were lucky to be invited to be part of the attribute trial, which is looking at AG10, which is an investigational small molecule that stabilizes TTR. So kind of a tefamidus competitor, if you will, by Edos Therapeutics. So we have, are actively enrolling in this trial, and we've been able to use patients who couldn't afford to fam to be able to get them in this clinical trial to potentially get them a, a therapeutic agent, you know, obviously to, to help them in the meantime. So, you know, cardiac amyloid is a, an exciting field. Um, we now have therapies. Um, we now have treatments. But just like with a lot of things, um, there's still, you know, little speed bumps um, that need to be kind of worked through along the way. So, Jason, just for an understanding of the advancement in treatment. What's the prognosis for someone today that has amyloid that is treated compared to the prognosis a few years ago? You know, is this an, are these uh, you know incredible treatments that are that are curing people, or are these just progressing delay? Uh, that's the first que you know first question. The next question is, um, I was going to ask you about the role for transplantation and younger patients, maybe there isn't one, but what's the current thinking on, on those kind of things? Yeah, those are um, great questions. So the disease course, so the median survival, and this is what we tell patients, the median survival after diagnosis without treatment for your hereditary, you know, TTR, cardiomyopathy patients is about two and a half years, right? Um, so not great. Um, and then the median survival after diagnosis without treatment for your wild type patients is about three and a half years. So the hereditary, you know, as you might imagine with the, with the abnormal protein, the, their survival is a little bit lower. You know, a lot of the reason why, you know, it says the median survival after diagnosis, right? So these patients have usually struggled with symptoms for, you know, many 
um, if not several years before actual diagnosis, kind of similar to pulmonary hypertension patients where the mean time to diagnose is about four years. So hopefully with advancements and, and, and awareness, you know, we can identify patients sooner, which means that their median survival will be longer, but the data is what it is. And you can just average the two and basically your median survival is about three years. So this is a, a serious disease process, um, something that we tell all of our patients that we take seriously. And now with truly disease modifying medications, you know, the mortality can improve. Um, and particularly for the, um, for the ATTRACT trial, the reduction in uh, all-cause, all-cause mortality was about a 13.4% absolute difference in mortality, um, which is just a number needed to treat of seven and a half to prevent one death after two and a half years. And in the cardiology world, the number needed to treat of seven is actually quite good. You know, despite its expense, um, you can, you know, really change the trajectory of, the, of this disease process. And of course, you know, that's just at two and a half years. If you imagine that these curves continue to separate, hopefully you could either double or even triple the life expectancy of some of these patients. Now, of course, other things that's added to that be the age of the patient, right? It's hard to make a, an 85-year-old live to 95, um, you know, in this day and age. 85 has already kind of beat the odds, so to speak. So it, it all comes down to, you know, kind of how sick or not sick the patient is at the diagnosis, at the time of diagnosis, and of course their age, because it's possible some other process such as cancer or something else could, you know, take the life of the patient before the, before the amyloid would. Um, but those are generally kind of some of the rough um, estimations that we give for mortality for the patients. Jason, um, how do you follow these patients in the office? Is there a difference? in the uh, technician power phosphate scan, for example, um, with treatment, uh, let's say six months to a year, do you see actually a normalization of that scan, uh, either by technician power phosphate or CMR? So that is, a, that is an excellent question. So now we're getting into some of the kind of exciting things in the field. So now that we have a therapy, um, which was you know, FDA approved just in May of last year, so we have exactly a year's worth of approval on the medicine. So we can now begin to start answering some of those questions, right? So as patients improve, can we see that improvement? Can we detect that improvement on echo? Can we detect that improvement on cardiac MRI? You know, maybe there's some utility in showing progression or regression of the disease process with cardiac MRI. Um, Same thing with the technetium pyrophosphate scan. So these are all excellent questions and and unknown at this time. Um, We are kind of doing our own, you know, single center um, study repeating some of these exams a year after a patient has been starting on therapy and seeing if there is any quantifiable change either with echo or power processing scan or cardiac MRI if we had that um, before the patient started therapy. So these are all excellent questions and we hope in the next you know, few years um, as we have more patients on therapy we begin to kind of see if there is actual true regression, which I believe that there will be of this disease process. So again, emphasizing kind of the disease modifying aspect of these medications. Do you work with the um, transplant program? Um, Do you actually perform sometimes liver transplants since the the familial type, you know, will have just abnormal protein just coming out of the liver? Yep. So transplant has been a hot topic um, in in this disease process. So um, we can kind of take a little step to the side and talk about AL amyloid. So cardiac AL amyloid, um, there is some data for transplanting these patients, some positive data. In fact, I think before people used to shy away from transplants in these patients, but there have been several groups that have shown good outcomes, the same um, as patients with any other cardiomyopathic process. Patients with TTR amyloid, this becomes a little bit different. As you know, the wild type form of TTR amyloid is generally in older patients. Um, Usually a cutoff for age for heart transplantation is about 65 years old. You know, most patients uh, with, you know, wild type TTR amyloid are generally older than 70. But it's not true for the hereditary type. So patients with hereditary type TTR amyloid, they one of the um, transplant options for them is a heart liver. Um, So actually, when I was training at a UAB where you guys uh, in Birmingham, where you guys are at, we actually did the first heart liver transplant for a young hereditary um, TTR patient, um, and he did very well. Um, So those are some options for the younger hereditary type. Um, where you do the heart, you know, that has been damaged from the, the abnormal protein. And then, of course, the liver is, is exchanged for a new liver that doesn't make that abnormal protein. So those are both options, transplant options for uh, patients with, with uh, cardiac amyloid. 
Thank you very much. So if you're a patient that is um, very short of breath, and uh, if you're fatigued, tired, low energy, your pump function is normal, you have to think about amyloidosis. Now we have some very interesting treatment. Um, if you're that patient, let's discuss with the doctor and with the physician, because it's really, um, th there was no treatment before. So a lot of times it was almost academic uh, but now we have something that can make a difference for this patient's life. So yes, particularly if um, particularly if you have that re you know recurrent hospitalizations, you, you go into hospital, heart failure, get treated, go out, go into hospital, get heart failure, get treated, and people are like that's much worse than we would, we would have expected um, in the in the day and age of of uh, getting another opinion. I think this shows the importance of having a, a strong heart failure program and a heart failure section that's kind of leading the charge on this. Yeah, and I absolutely believe that the, the multidisciplinary aspect of this disease process is important. So neurologists, you know, they see these patients with polyneuropathy and orthopedic surgeons see these patients with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome and hematologists, you know, see these patients as well. So, you know, talking to our friends and colleagues in a multidisciplinary way in order to share these patients and get these patients to the right person is always important. Um, we also have an excellent relationship with our interventional cardiologists um, that do all of our TAVRs. As you know, depending on what data set you're looking at, the prevalence of TTR amyloid in those patients is anywhere from 5 to 25%, especially in your kind of paradoxical low flow, low gradient, um, severe AS patients. Um, so we've teamed up with our structural heart group and uh, have actually now begun routinely screening all of our TAVR patients. Um, at the time of discharge um, after their TAVR, just to make it easy for them to try to um, identify some of these patients and be able to get them treated. So again, you know, multidisciplinary is always good and um, being able to identify patients to get them feeling better you know, is good for everybody. I do have one question, actually, just to go, get back to the clinical part of this. Jason, what comes first in clinical exam? Is it, is it the carpal tunnel, the neuropathy, the heart failure, the liver? Like, What's the timeline? Because it sounds to me from everything you're saying that the earlier you catch this, the better. The earlier you can start treatment and diagnosis, the better. What's the, what's the symptom, uh, you know, timeline? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So, you know, generally, um, you know, it takes a few years before these patients get identified. So what is believed to be one of the first symptoms is actually the carpal tunnel syndrome. So carpal tunnel syndrome, erectile dysfunction, um, polyneuropathy. So it's really the nerve kind of issues usually precede the diagnosis by about anywhere from three to four years. And it's not until you get within a year of diagnosis when you start having the shortness of breath, orthostasis, pacemaker placement, um, you know, EKG with low voltage, LVH, you know, those all start getting within the year of diagnosis. So it's really kind of the, and it also it depends on, you know, the hereditary types um, are a little bit different, but generally speaking, it's usually the nerve aspect of things that really precede um, the diagnosis. And it's not until they start getting some of the cardiac manifestations um, when people really start trying to, you know, identify what's going on with patients. So is there, is there um, ongoing trials, upcoming trials, maybe looking at those people that have not got cardiac manifestations yet or strong ones to see if it can be prevented? That's a good question. So to my knowledge, there isn't, you know, prevention is always a, a tough pill to swallow, no pun intended, when that pill costs, you know, $250,000 a year. So I think for a lot of us, you know, in this field, trying to be good healthcare stewards, good stewards of, of money, you know, we generally won't start therapy on patients, you know, at least if it's approved for cardiac TTR amyloid. Now, if they have the peripheral neuropathy that they can get on some of the other medicines, you know, the Tegzetti or on Patro, but from a cardiac standpoint, you know, if they are truly NYHA class one symptoms, meaning no symptoms at all, we just monitor those patients very closely, but as soon as they develop heart failure symptoms, um, then yes, you know, we would offer um, treatment and, and get these patients on treatment. And, you know, the clinical trials would bear that, you know, they only recruited or enrolled people with NYJ class two to three to four symptoms. So no asymptomatic, you know, patients were enrolled in any of the cardiac TTR trials. Stress is the point that we shouldn't practice medicine in the silo. The heart team just getting larger and larger but so important to take care of that patient, working closely with the oncologist, as well as a neurologist and nephrologist. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jason Guichard, Dr. Ahmed. Um, appreciate again your help. And um, we hope that you enjoyed this podcast.
Thank you very much.